Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, I would like to begin a brand new mini-series. It's a two-part series entitled, The Harvest. I believe we are fast approaching the end times. And these times that we know it, how, how we know it, that the way of life that we have, it's quickly changing. It's, it's, it's different now. So, so much different now than when I was a young boy. Just think about all the changes that you've seen over your lifetime. I mean, think about free speech. Think about travel, the way we, we used to travel. Think about your rights to peacefully gather, your rights to worship, your rights to religion. Think about all the changes. I'm telling you, the time is wrapping up. Time as we know it is wrapping up. Eternity is fast approaching. The return of Jesus is nigh at hand. And whatever we're going to do, we have to do it now. Uh, believe me when I tell you that the conquering of the world is completed. And the great delusion has already gone out and covered all mankind. People... Who, who cannot see. They're, they're either steeped in ignorance or they're just plain have their heads buried in the sand and they refuse to see. But the time for this side of eternity is quickly, quickly wrapping up. So whatever we're going to do or whatever we're going to accomplish, we had better do it. We have better accomplish it. And we had better do it quickly as quickly as possible and remember the only thing that really really matters the only thing that will last is what we do for Jesus so if the Lord has a harvest for you now is your last opportunity to reap that harvest the enemy is coming and Jesus is on his way back so with that said let us turn to our message. This message is entitled, Harvest Time is Nigh. Turn with me please to Judges chapter 6 verse 2 through 6. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains, and the caves, and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Every time the Israelites planted crops, they would care for those crops. They would water those plot, crops. They would weed those crops. They would fertilize those crops. And when those crops were brought to mat maturity, and it would look like they would have a really good harvest, the enemy would come in and devour their increase. The people of God, the Israelites, had drifted away from him. They no longer prayed. They no longer sought the face of God. They had come out from under the protection of Almighty God. So at the time of harvest, the enemy would show up and would take their harvest. Every time the harvest was near, without fail, the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern people would swoop down on Israel and steal their harvest. The enemy would take what God had for them. Now, some people will say, nobody can take what God has for you. Nobody can take what God has for me. Well, that, that is true. But the other side is equally true. You can certainly give it up to the enemy. Though God has it for you, you can give it away because of disobedience. 
Every time one of God's people is coming into the harvest, the enemy shows up. He, he somehow knows when, when, when the harvest is near. Whether it's in, in the spiritual, he sees it or, 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 or whatever. He knows when your harvest is there. And he comes in. He comes swooping in to kill, to steal, and to devour your harvest. And you are no different from anybody else. This is what happens to everyone who comes up on a harvest because the enemy comes in and he's looking for a loophole. He's looking for space in. He's looking for a legal entry to steal your harvest. So if you have, if he finds a legal hole in you or in, in your, your lifestyle, then he has a legal right to steal your harvest. And yes, it is very discouraging. But the good news is don't give up but rather pray up. For even the great patriarch, um, Jacob, was discouraged just before he got his greatest miracle back in Genesis chapter 42. You see, there was a great and severe famine in all the land. And the only place where food was found was in Egypt. The same place where, where Joseph, his son, was sold into slavery. His brothers had sold Joseph and he was taken down to Egypt and Potiphar bought him as a slave. So Israel, or Jacob, sent his 10 sons down to Egypt to buy grain so that their households and their animals would not starve to death and perish. When the brothers went down to Egypt to buy food, who should they meet but their brother Joseph whom they had sold into slavery. Now everybody thought that he was dead. Everybody thought that he was no longer in the picture. Everybody thought that Joseph was no more. Joseph recognized them right away, but they did not recognize him. You know, sometimes, even when we come to face to face with our sin, with our transgressions, come to face to face with what we're doing wrong, we don't recognize it. The preacher will be preaching directly at you. And the only thing left for him to do is to call your name. He said, I am talking directly to you. And still, you don't figure it out. Still, you think that it's for somebody else. Probably the one who's sitting next to me. But it's not for me, it's for somebody else. We come face to face with what God wants to change in our life. And yet, we do not recognize it. But anyway, moving on. The, the brothers did not recognize Joseph. But Joseph recognized them and accused them of spying out the land. Of course, they denied that, 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 they, were, that they were spies. But he questioned them closely, like he was interrogating them. And they said that they had another brother, a younger brother. Joseph told them that in order to prove themselves true and that they were not spies, they would have to bring their youngest brother down to Egypt so that he may see him for himself and believe them that they indeed were not spies. So Joseph kept, kept, kept Simeon as assurance that they would come back. And then he sent them home with food for their starving households. And when they were coming back, they were to bring their youngest brother, Benjamin, so that he might see him. If they did not bring Benjamin back, they would not be able to buy any more green. But when they were leaving, Joseph gave orders to have each man's money put back in his sack. And that night, when the brothers stopped, they found the money was back in their sacks. And they were terrified. They did not know what was happening. They thought they may, may be being judged because of their sins that they did not recognize earlier. When they got home, they relayed the story. They told their father everything that had happened. And here's where we pick up the story. Genesis chapter 42, verse 36 through 38. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. 
I, I don't know how that could be a security. I could never harm my grandchildren. But nevertheless, Reuben says, kill my two sons if I, have not, if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. And he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm should come to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Jacob was feeling like the whole world was against him. Everything had come up against him. But in fact, God was for him and was working it all out to his favor. His harvest was near. It was so close that he could reach out his hand and touch it. Still, Jacob felt like everything was against him. He felt like he couldn't win for losing. Do you ever feel like that? You cannot win for losing? But you know, the truth of the matter was, God was working it all out. Even if he couldn't see it. And God is working it all up for us. Even when we don't see it, God is working on our behalf. The truth is, Jacob would see his favorite son, Joseph, again. Joseph, the dream was not dead. The same son that he had presumed dead, the same son that he had presumed no more, that he would never ever see him again, he would see. Not only would he see him, but he would see his sons. He would see his own grandsons from Joseph. And that's how it is with us sometimes. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you might fe be feeling like that right now. Maybe you might feel like every time your ship is on the horizon, the fog swoops in and you lose sight of your ship. If that is indeed you, don't turn and walk away. Hold on. Or maybe your ship is in a harbor, but a storm is brewing and won't let the ship dock. Let me encourage you, do not give up, but hold on. Fight the fight. Maybe you're under a spiritual attack. Do not stop praying. Do not give up. Maybe the enemy is attacking you because your harvest is, is near. It's harvest time for you. This is a time for you to put on your armor and go to spiritual war and take back that which belongs to you. March into the enemy's camp. Take back what he stole from you. And while you're there, get some spoils of war. Those dreams that you've dreamed for so long are finally here. It's time for you to fight. Do not give up, but rather pray up. Seek. Cry out to Almighty God. He is your refuge. He will never let you sink. Ask and you will be given. Seek and you will find. Remember that every time harvest time was near for, for the people of Israel, the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east would come up against them and steal their harvest. And as a reminder, you are no different. God doesn't love them anymore. He doesn't love you anymore. God does not love people differently. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You don't have to perish. God has made a way for you to be redeemed through the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. It doesn't matter where you come from, where you grew up. It does not matter. God has made a way for you to be redeemed. And if you're redeemed, he's coming back for you. God is a God of love, and God will deliver you out of each and every situation that you find yourself in. 
So what did they do? What did the Israelites do when the enemy came in and they were stealing, uh, the enemy was stealing their harvest? What did they do? I'll tell you what they did. They cried out to the Lord. They cried out for help. And maybe there's a spiritual battle out in front of you. Maybe you need to fight right now. It's time to cry out to God. It's time to seek the face of God. It's time to prepare for spiritual battle. During one of our 21 day fasts that we, we began our, our, our year with, we began our year with a 21 day fast. During one of those fasts, we were given two words, praise and proclamation. We had since deduced that the Lord was telling us to add praise and proclamation to our prayer. So maybe it's time to put on spiritual armor and begin to fight the good fight. But in order to fight the good fight, you will need three main things. Effectual fervent prayers, number one. Number two, praise and worship. And number three, proclamation. So let us take a little closer look at each one of, uh, of, of these three things. Number one, effectual fervent prayers. Maybe it's time for you to take it to the next level. You've been praying, but you, you, you're not moving the hand of God. You, you, you're not opening up the heavens. Maybe it's time to add some fasting to your prayers. In the Gospel of, of Mark, there's an account of Jesus' disciples trying to cast out a demonic spirit, but they could not. When Jesus came on the scene, he drove the demon out. So when the, the, the disciple was alone with, with Jesus, they asked him, why couldn't we drive out that demon? Why, why couldn't we do it? You came and you just drove it out. Why could we not do it? And this was Jesus' reply, Mark chapter 9, verse 29. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. By prayer and and fasted. According to, my, to, to Mark, some battles can only be won through the effectual fervent prayers mixed with fasting. Paul said that he fasted many, many times. He fasted a lot. Look at James chapter 5 verse 16. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Much is achieved when you begin to pray fervently. The key to prayer is persistence. So persistent, effectual, fervent prayer will stop the enemy in his tracks and put a harvest in your storehouse. I want to say that one more time. Persistent, effectual, fervent prayer will stop the enemy in his tracks and put a harvest in your storehouse. Number two, praise. You can never discount the importance of praise and worship. It is an integral part of seeking the face of God. I want you to look at Psalm 147, verse 1. It says, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Psalm 135, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord. And Psalm 22, verse 3. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. God demands praise. He encompasses his people when they praise and worship him. God is enthroned on the praises of his people. You want to have God in your midst. Begin to praise. Begin to worship. Begin to call upon his name. And the Lord will draw near because you're drawing near to him through your worship, through your praise. And God will draw near to you. Psalm 22 says that he's enthroned on the praises of his people. The Lord responds to praise. Number three, proclaiming. At the end of all of my messages, I always try to encourage you to learn scripture and then commit 
those verses, those scripture verses to memory. So that when you're spiritually attacked, or if, if you're tempted, or if you're discouraged, or if anything that's going on in your life, you just pull those out, you call, you recall those, those verses, and you begin to speak those. You begin, begin to proclaim those verses. I want you to turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. The only way to overcome and conquer the enemy is through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Son of the living God, and by the word of your testimony. It is impossible to overcome the enemy um, or, or to overcome by the word of your testimony by keeping quiet, by keeping silent. You cannot overcome with your testimony by being shut up. You've got to proclaim. And that's why during the pandemic, the, the, the officials were trying to shut up the church. They wanted to keep the church silent. They did not want proclamation to go out, to fill the airwaves, to begin to, for God to begin to move. Because when God begins to move, nobody or nothing can stop him. But we have to proclaim God's word. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Please turn with me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus used scripture to combat Satan. Whenever he, he was tempted in the wilderness and, and um, Satan would, would come against him, Jesus would say, it is written. It is written. But I want you to watch this. Look at this. If scripture is God breathed, then it could be, could, could be said or thought of as the testimony of God. Likewise, if Jesus is God, then it would be thought of as Jesus using his own testimony to overcome temptation. Jesus overcame by the word of his testimony. Oh, happy day when our sins were washed away. We have a testimony because of Jesus. So let us use it. Let us fight against the enemy. Let us not be silent, but let us Shout loud. Let us proclaim the word of God. The word of God is so powerful, Satan tries to use it against us. But he either misquotes or he misuses scripture in order to try to trip us up, try to get us off track, try to knock us down. He, uses, he used the word of God in the Garden of Eden with Eve, and he tripped her up. He used it in the desert with Jesus, hoping that he could do the same thing. But Jesus knew the word, and he turned it around, and he, he in turn used the word against the devil, and he overcame because he committed the word of God to memory. He hid God's word away in his heart that he might not sin against Almighty God. Satan still uses it in these last days against us as well. And if we don't know the word of God, we will be defeated and we will be conquered. We need to be like Jesus. Jesus turned the, the sword around and used it on Satan and overcame. Only in the hands of a skilled warrior or a trained person is a weapon truly dangerous. In the hands of a novice, a weapon is useless. When I was a child, I saw a movie, and I believe it was Robinson Crusoe. He had a gun, and one of the natives got the gun. And when Robinson Crusoe came, the native started pointing the gun at 
at Robinson Crusoe, but the barrel was pointing the wrong way. The gun was pointing the wrong and he began to jab at Robinson Crusoe. And so Robinson Crusoe was not afraid. He, he knew that the gun could not harm him because the weapon was pointing the wrong way. Let me tell you, the enemy is not afraid of God's word when we don't know it or we misuse it. When, when we have to, 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 to use it and we begin to point it the wrong way and we begin to jab with it instead of using it as a sword as it is meant to be, will be like Robinson, that the enemy will be like Robinson Crusoe and he will walk up and we take away a weapon and render it useless. And that's what he did to Eve in the garden. I want to share, share some examples of scripture to use. For finances for ministry, you can use 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. For your own finances, you can use Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Remember what, what I said a few minutes ago about using the weapons? As it is with all scripture, you can't use verses that don't apply to you. And then you expect them to work. It just doesn't work that way. The verses that you use have to be for you. They have to be able to be applied to you. Like this word, this verse, for instance. You can't use this verse, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, that we just read. You can't use it if you're not a tither. You can't use it if you're not a giver. If you don't give offerings, you can't use this verse and expect it to work. You say, well, I use that verse all the time, and it doesn't work for me. Uh, ha have you tithed? No? Okay. Then it doesn't work. It will not work for you if you do not do what the Philippians did. The Philippians were givers. And, and Paul said, because of your giving, God will supply all your needs. When, when we do things like that, it'll be like Robinson Crusoe's gun in the hands of a native, pointing the wrong way and jabbing. The enemy will only laugh, and he'll attack us only more. Let me give you one more. One of my favorite ones. Psalm 23. Learn that whole psalm. Learn the whole thing. Commit it to memory. And when you're down, when you're lonely, when you're discouraged, or even when you're afraid and terrified, quote Psalm 23, and comfort will come. I guarantee it. I know. I've used it so, so many times in so, so many situations. Even in worship, I will use Psalm 23. So in conclusion, I want to encourage you not to give up when the enemy comes in at harvest times, and when he comes in to steal your harvest, all of that's in the past. This harvest that's coming, stop him in his tracks. You might be on the brink of, a, of one of the greatest miracles ever. So hold fast to what God has promised. And he has only promised good for you. He only wants what's good for you. He's a good, good God. He's a loving Father. He loves you. He cares for you. So, do you have a promise from God? So, are you a child of God? In order to receive the promises of God, you have to be a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you can be. It's easy. God's made it so, so easy for us. Here's the thing. All you have to do is to ask. Here's how. Pray this prayer with me if you want to be a child of God. Heavenly Father, 
Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my iniquities. Help me to live for you. Increase my faith. Help me to have the faith of a mustard seed. Give me boldness and give me confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, as usual, I want to encourage you to get yourself a Bible and begin to highlight those verses that you can proclaim the Word of God and make your life line up with the Scripture so that you're able to use the weapons that's given to us uh, the right way and it's not be like Robinson Crusoe's weapon in the hands of the native, but rather it be like a sword in the hands of a skilled warrior. Because the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. The next thing I want you to do is to find yourself a Bible-believing church. Not one of those progressive churches that you can live anyway. No. Find a church that believes that there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's what we all want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, as usual, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.